Today we cover the fundamental theorem of calculus part two and this part is equally as important as part one. Here's what it says. If f is continuous, once again, that's very important always, if f is continuous on a to b, do you think we have to pay attention to if a function is continuous? Oh, yeah. Yes, you have to, you know, you have to look at the interval and you have to say, hey, is it continuous on the interval? And if capital F is any antiderivative, and we've learned what those are, if capital F is any antiderivative of the function F, on A to B, then here's what I know. This is, this is the thing that kind of brings it all together with integration. I know then that the integral from A to B of a function is equal to do you remember that capital F is the antiderivative? The value of the antiderivative at B, F, <coughs> capital F of B, minus the value of the antiderivative at A. Capital F is the antiderivative. All right. So let's do an example. Let's say that we are asked to find the integral from negative 1 to 3 of x cubed plus 1 dx. And we're doing this all analytically on this problem. We're going to do this one on paper. So first thing we need is an antiderivative. All right, and we can split this up because of this plus sign, <clears throat> I can split this up into two separate antiderivatives. What's the antiderivative of x cubed? Using the power rule. x to the fourth over four. Plus, the antiderivative of one is just one x or x. Now let me show you a little bit of notation this is kind of calculus notation. Once you have your antiderivative, it's kind of standard to put a little bracket around it and then put your limits of integration right here. And what that does is it helps remind me that now that I have my antiderivative, now I need to plug those in. So the first thing I'm going, remember what this theorem said. It's f of b minus f of a. <clears throat> so now I'm going to plug 3n for x. So I'm going to have 3 to the fourth over 4 plus 3. And I'm going to subtract. Now notice, you better learn to put these in parentheses or you're, or you're going to make a lot of mistakes. I'm going to subtract, now I'm going to plug in the negative one. Negative one to the fourth over four plus negative one. Notice I am subtracting the entire thing. That's why I put it in parentheses. Okay, and the rest of it from there is just you know, being able to work with numbers. If I did not have a calculator, we could still do this problem. Three to the fourth, what's that? Isn't that 81, right? So I have 81 over four plus three. Now, negative one to the fourth, isn't that gonna be a positive one? So I'm just gonna subtract one fourth 
And if I subtract a negative 1, it's the same thing as adding 1. <clears throat> Again, you have to pay attention you know, to those parentheses and your distributive property. So what do I have now? Well, I have 81 fourths minus 1 fourth, which is just 80 fourths. And then I have plus 3 and plus 1, so that's just plus 4. And isn't 80 over 4 just 20? Okay, so this is going, my final answer is going to be 24. Now, what does that number represent? That number has a meaning. It's very important in calculus that we know the meaning of my number. What does it mean? What is an integral? What does an integral tell me? It's the area under the curve. This, I'm going to pick a different color. This is an area. Okay, we have to keep that visual picture in mind. If I were to graph this function, isn't this just a cubic moved up one? So this would be a cubic moved up one unit, like that. And we have just found the area from negative 1 to 3. So what we just found out is that this shaded in region that I just colored in, the area of this shaded in region is exactly 24. All right, it is very important that we keep the mental picture tied in to what we're doing analytically. Now, when you are doing this on the graphing calculator, remember f and int that I showed you in the graphing calculator? All right. That's what, it, what this, all of this is what the graphing calculator is doing. Okay. It's finding the antiderivative and then it's plugging in the numbers. Okay. So um, that's important. Let's go to the next problem. Find the area between y equals 4 minus x squared the x-axis from 0 is less than x is less than 3. I guess that should say find the area between y equals 4 minus x squared and the x-axis. That would make more sense. And. And the x-axis. Now, this is why I told you to, you have to keep the connection between what an integral means um, and doing it on paper. What is this saying? Well, it's saying, okay, I've got this upside down, <coughs> excuse me, parabola that goes through four, all right? And I want to find the area between the parabola and the x-axis up to 3. All right. Well, isn't this just an integral? Okay. In reality, what they're asking me to find is the integral from 0 to 3 of 4 minus x squared dx. Use an antiderivative. Use the second fundamental theorem of, or part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus. I'm going to pause the video and let you try it. Ready? Go. Before you get any farther, there's one little thing I need to point out to you, though, that we haven't seen on this problem. I drew my graph over here incorrectly. This graph of this function, if you look at 4 minus x squared, and I set it equal to zero. Do you see one of the zeros is going to be two? 
So I drew this graph incorrectly. This graph goes through two. Okay, it goes through two, and we're finding the area from zero to three. Here's three. So what I have, all right, is I have a two-part area on this problem, okay? This problem, I'm finding this area in here, yes, but I'm coming all the way up to three. So if you try to do this problem the way that we did just a minute ago, we have to consider some things because this is asking for an area between the axis and this area in here. This area is going to be negative. That's a negative area. So what do I have to do on this problem? I have to break it up into two integrals. All right, so let me give you that, and then I'll let you finish up the problem. You have to do this problem as the integral from 0 to 2 of 4 minus x squared. And then you have to add the absolute value okay, of the integral from 2 to 3. Okay, so whatever that, whatever that integral is from 2 to 3, you have to make it positive. All right? And now I will pause the video and let you uh, work on it on your own. Okay, uh, working through the problem, first thing I need here is an antiderivative, which is going to be 4x minus x cubed over 3, and I need to evaluate that from 0 to 3. So that's going to be 4 times 3 minus 27 thirds, so 12 minus 9 is 3. Okay, now, but that's just plugging in the 3. All right, so this 12 minus 9 is 3, but I still have to subtract what I get when I plug in. Oh, wait a minute. What did I? Yeah, some of you caught it. I was supposed to be doing that from 0 to 2. Sorry. Oops. 0 to 2. Yeah, the first, the first integral, remember, is 0 to 2, okay? So this is going to be 8 minus 2 cubed is 8, 8 minus 8 thirds. Yikes, making all kinds of mistakes today. So that's going to be 24 thirds minus 8 thirds, which is 16 thirds, and when I subtract 0, it's still just 16 thirds. So what did I just find out? I found out the area of this in here is 16 thirds. All right. Now, when I do this next part, I can use the same antiderivative, which is 4x minus x cubed over 3. And now I can plug in 3, which will be 4 times 3, which is 12, minus 3 cubed, which is 27 over 3, which is 9. That's the first part. And then I need to subtract what I get when I plug in 2. Well, that's 16 thirds. We found that out already. So 3 minus 16 thirds, that's going to be like... Um, 9 thirds minus 16 thirds, which is negative 7 thirds, but I'm doing the absolute value of that. 
So it's positive 7 thirds. So I'm combining 7 thirds and 16 thirds. 16 thirds plus 7 thirds is 23 thirds. That's the answer to this question. But what if this problem would have just said, find the integral of this function from 0 to 3? What if it just would have said, find the integral from 0 to 3 of 4 minus x squared dx? Would the answer be different? Yes. The answer would be different. OK. As a matter of fact, let me prove it to you. We already know the antiderivative. The antiderivative is 4x minus x cubed over 3. If I evaluate that from 3 to 0, then we already showed that that's 12 minus 3 cubed over 3, which is 12 minus 9, which is 3. And then I subtract what I get when I plug in 0, which is just 0. My final answer is 3. Why is that the case? Why is that number different when I just do it straight from 0 to 3 instead of breaking it up to, into two integrals like we did? Because when we do this, this accounts for negative areas. It's amazing when Isaac Newton made this discovery. This formula accounts for the negative areas. Okay, and that's why this answer, when I just do it from 0 to 3, is different than when I break it up into two problems. All right. We come back to here. Remember what I told you. I said that this region right here has a negative area. Okay. So look. Look at this right here. If I subtract the 7 thirds, remember this area right here was the 7 thirds. If I do 16 thirds, sorry. If I do 16 thirds minus 7 thirds, if I subtract that, that area, don't I get 9 thirds? Which is that? Okay. So what I'm getting at is that if we don't break it up into two problems, all right, it accounts for the negative areas. But this problem specifically said, find the exact area. So that's why we had to do the absolute value of it. Okay? So, one last problem. Let's say they give me a graph, uh, and it looks like this. And this value over here is 8. This value right here is 4. This is 3, 2, 1, and 5, 6, 7. Okay? They give me that graph. And then they make a statement like this. Let h of x equal the integral from 1 to x of f of t dt. Okay? And I believe they also say something like uh, the function is continuous and it has a domain from 0 to 8. Okay? Of course, it's important that it's continuous. All right? So, then they're going to give you some questions like this. They're going to test your understanding of the fundamental theorem of calculus. They're going to say, find h of 1. 
And this is a, a great case for us to remember what I've told you before, that when you don't know what to do, do what you know how to do. This says, find h of 1. Well, how do I find a function value of anything? Don't I put the 1 in for x? So if h of x is the integral from 1 to x of f of t dt, then h of 1 would be the integral from 1 to 1 of f of t dt. I heard you say it. That's 0. If you do the integral from 1 to 1, we know it automatically is 0. Let's do another one. Question B. Is h of 0 positive or negative? And then maybe they say justify your answer. Well, what would h of 0 be? h of 0 would be the integral from 1 to 0 of f of t dt. So, now hold on just a minute though. Let's go back to my graph. By the way, I, I don't know that I told you, this is the graph of f. Okay, that's the graph of f. Now, if I come back to my question, isn't there a rule that says I can switch these limits of integration? By doing something, what do I do? I put a negative out in front of it and it becomes the integral negative times the integral from 0 to 1 of f. Now, why did I point out the graph? We've got to go back to the graph. Is this area in here positive or negative? As it is right now, it's positive, right? But the way this problem is defined, when I plug in 0, the 0 comes up here. I flip my integrals and multiply it by a negative. If I multiply a negative times a positive, a negative times a positive is a negative. All right, and we have justified our answer. Okay? Well, the graph, the reason the graph was important was because I needed to look at the original graph and see if the original area was positive or negative. The original area was positive, but I multiplied it by a negative. Whatever this value is in here, this is positive. If it would have been a negative area, okay, then when you multiply it by negative, the area would become positive. Do you always have to put your smallest integral um, Yeah, we normally want to work smallest to biggest. Um, the question was, by the way, for those of you taking notes at home, do I always want to put the smaller number on the bottom when I'm integrating? And yes, we do. Okay? So, um, question C, find where h of x is a maximum. I think they actually say find the value of x. for which h of x is a mat is for which h of x is a maximum. I think that's the question. Find the value of x for where h of x is a maximum. Well, let's look at this. If h of x is the integral from 1 to x 
of f of t dt. How did we learn to find maximums? How did we learn how to find extrema? We, we did a whole big section on that. Don't I have to take the derivative of it and set it equal to zero? Right, to find critical points. Well, what's the derivative of h? Isn't it the derivative of the integral from 1 to x? Right? And what did we learn in the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1? The derivative of the integral of a function is just the function at that top limit of integration. It's just f of x. So let's go back. And what are we doing? Don't we have to set that equal to 0? Right? To find a maximum, I need to know where is f of x equal to 0? So let's go back to my graph. Looks to me like 1, 4, and 8 are all possibilities. So wrapping this thing up, yes, there were three places here where the function was equal to zero, but if you recall how we find if something is a maximum or a minimum, we're looking, we're thinking about the first derivative test. Where does it change from a positive value to a negative value, and that's right here at four. And so it achieves its maximum value when x equals four. And we will stop there for today.